Good morning, everybody. So we are busy looking at a biblical account of a Christian's responsibility pertaining to the works of darkness. We are looking at the influence of evil spirits, etc., etc., and what the Word of God explains to us we are supposed to do concerning these things. I want to bring up a scripture for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 says, <clears throat> Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Listen to these words. When you look at society today, this is one of the biggest areas where we are failing. Because when the word of God says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, today people can't wait to mess and play around with the things of darkness. Yes, even in the church. And it should not be that way. But rather expose them. Do you hear these words? It's not my words. It's the words of God. He says that we should, number one, make sure that we have nothing to do with the things of the enemy. And then he says to us, but we should be actively busy exposing the works of the enemy. Why, why, why should we expose it? As a warning for people to know, for people to understand what it is really about. Last week, we spoke about the modern manifestations of what God warned the Israelites of when they went into the promised land. The promised land was a beautiful place, but it was tainted by evil. What does the proverb say? Curiosity killed the cat. Here's what unfortunately is very true about most people. We are curious, we are inquisitive. And we want to know, but why do you do that? Why are you going there? How do you manage to be so successful? Why does things always happen for you? And here's what some people will then say. Oh, but you know, I went to the witch doctor, and they did this, and they did that, and they gave me this potion. And I, I did this, and it put something on my boss, and now my boss pays me double. Oh, wow. Really? Jeez, I can do with a big increase. By the way, where did you see this guy? How do I get there? How do I know these things? Because I've been involved in ministry for the last 25, give or take years, and I've seen it all and I've heard it all. Let me tell you something. One of the main reasons why a lot of people get involved in stuff they shouldn't get involved in is because somebody told them it works. Somebody came with a so-called good report that this and this and this brings healing or brings change or brings transformation or brings prosperity. And you know what? Unfortunately, sometimes we're in a position where we're already battling and we think to ourselves, well, that might be a lifeline for me. What if I was to, to try that? I've shared this uh, testimony quite a few times. Let's go back to it. A woman is at work. She works with a group of other women. There's quite a few of them in the office. The one day the one woman comes and says, guess what? I saw a fortune teller yesterday. And this fortune teller told me all sorts of things about my life. And then this fortune teller told me that I'm going to be rich and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And everybody's all excited because that all sounds so good. And so the second woman goes in the same week to see the same fortune teller. And she comes back with a very good report. All these wonderful things are going to happen in my life, etc., etc. So the third woman that's sitting there, is a Christian, <clears throat> knows that she should not be involved in these things, but then she thinks to herself, wow, you know, my two friends got such a good word. Probably there's something good for me too. The Bible says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. <clears throat> there's a reason why God tells us not to mess with that. Why do you tell your children not to run around with a knife? Because you know they might fall and stab themselves. Why do you not allow your children to play in the front seat of the car? Because they might start it accidentally or put the handbrake down. You know, there's reasons why we sometimes say don't do things. We understand why. God understands why he warns us. So disregarding the word of God, disregarding scripture, the third lady goes to the fortune teller. 
And the fortune teller tells her there are two good things that's going to happen and one bad thing. The woman says, okay, let me hear the good things first. You're going to get a certain amount of money. It was a fairly big amount of money. She's all excited. She says, and then you're going to get another amount of money. Also a fairly decent amount of money. And of course, this woman is thinking to herself, wow, I should have come here a long time ago. <clears throat> but then things change. Because then the fortune teller looks at her and says to her, your husband is going to die in a car accident. She did not go there to hear that. The Bible says, give the devil no place. The Bible also warns us that life and death is in the power of the tongue and they that use it will eat its fruit. So here's the thing. The devil knows that if he can get us to come there, it gives him the opportunity to speak something over your life. Nothing that the devil speaks over your life is a blessing. Everything that he speaks over your life is a curse. The word of God says of Satan the following. You are children of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abides not in the truth because there is no truth in him. He's a murderer. Satan is always looking for a way to get to us. The devil doesn't like you, but don't fall apart because of it, because he doesn't like me either. He likes nobody. But he's waiting for an opportunity to get a gap to have something over your life. The problem with mankind is when we hear somebody doing well, yeah, or doing something good, yeah, or prospering in some way, everybody wants to know how. You know, the Americans always believe there must be a secret to everything. It's not a secret how to do well. It's written in the word of God. Today, when you hear my voice, if you obey me, I will bless you. How do you come to a place that you live a blessed life? You begin to listen to the word of God. You know the word of God. You apply the word of God. You understand the word of God. You commit yourself to the word of God. And can I tell you what happens? Things change. Satan loves to come with shortcuts. You're going to do it this way and you'll be blessed. You're going to do it that way and you'll be blessed. And nine times, well, in Satan's case, ten times out of ten, it's not biblical. The woman had a shock. She was not expecting to hear these words. She went home that day and her husband knew that she was going to go and see this woman. So, of course, he wanted to know. So, what did she say? And she didn't want to tell him. He said to her, whatever it is, tell me. I can deal with it. So she told him. He was pleased with the first amount of money. He was pleased with the second amount of money. And when she told him that you're going to die in a car accident, he laughed and he said, I don't believe in this rubbish. This is what happened. They got the first amount of money. Short while later, they got the second amount of money. Now there was panic stations in the house because two of the prophecies were fulfilled. Well, let's not call them prophecies. Two of the, the devil's lies were fulfilled. And so some of you are going to ask me, but how on earth is that possible? Well, by giving the devil the power to speak into your life, you give him the power to bring it to pass. And then one night her husband doesn't come home. Very late at night, she gets a phone call. It's from one of the local hospitals. Her husband was in a car accident. He's currently in intensive care. He broke, if I remember correctly, something like two-thirds of the bones in his body. He hit the tree at 120 kilometers an hour. Nobody knows how he hit the tree. He should not have hit the tree. He's not dead, but he's clinging to life by a thread. She gets the whole world to start praying with her. And I do believe the prayer stopped the hand of the spirit of death. But then something very interesting happens. Her husband is not healing. His bones are not recovering. We all know that when you break your bones, your bones should heal. Yes, it will take time. The way God created our bodies, our bodies do heal. This man was not healing. What was happening? The spirit of death was putting its foot down and saying, I have the power to take this man. The prayers were keeping him from going. 
but there was a tug of war going on between death and life. Eventually, they sent the gentleman home. He was at home in a hospital bed. The reason they sent him home was because he'd been in hospital for such a long period of time, and there was no change, and so his wife was taking care of him at home, but he had no life. I went there to pray for him. I began to question them about the circumstances surrounding the accident, and then all of this was conveyed on me, and I began to understand. I said to them, well, I do believe that this man is cursed. He was cursed by the words spoken by the fortune teller. And until that curse is not broken, your husband will not heal. So they said to me, how do we fix this? I said, we have to come before God. We're going to confess what happened. We're going to repent of what we did. I want to say something to you. There's some of you, yeah, you've messed up badly in life. And sometimes the enemy will try and hold that against you constantly. But let me tell you something. God forgives our sin. But we must still first come to him and we must humble ourselves before him and we must say sorry and we must mean it. You know, there's a difference between saying sorry because you got caught out and now you're in trouble and there's the sorry that is a real conviction in your heart. You realize what you did was wrong and you want to change. They're not the same thing. I think this man was sincere and this woman was sincere. I prayed with them as a family. It was the husband, it was the wife, and the daughter. Until today, after 20-something years, I have never yet to see, I've never yet seen the same thing happen that I saw that day. I led the entire family in a prayer to confess to God what they did, to repent of what they did, and to ask God for forgiveness. And it started with the daughter. The daughter started shaking. And when the daughter stopped shaking, the mother started shaking in exactly the same way as the daughter. When the mother stopped shaking, the father stopped the shaking in exactly the same way as the daughter and the mother. When the father stopped shaking, he gave like a sigh. He got up out of the bed. Do you know that in a matter of a couple of months, his body healed? By the grace of God, he was healed. What was it that caused this man to be in that situation? Well, it was a whole bunch of things, but number one, curiosity. You see, the thing is, we are very curious of what other people do. And when it looks like somebody goes somewhere or has something that we don't, we want to know, what are you doing? The thing is, there are some things that is worth copying, and there's other things that's definitely not worth copying. We need to know and we need to understand that if it has something to do with the works of darkness, you better run. There's nothing wrong with being afraid of the works of darkness. Listen, yeah, that's good fear, not bad fear. Because we should have a healthy fear and a healthy, a healthy respect for God and a healthy fear for the rubbish that the enemy gets into, uh, into people's lives because it brings destruction. Now, the modern forms that we get from uh, uh, comparing to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 from verse 9 that I read last week, uh, people today play with Ouija boards. Let me say something about Ouija boards. Ouija boards is not a game. It is a doorway to the occult world. It is a doorway to satanic powers that are much, much more powerful than most people realize. I cannot tell you how many times I've been to homes where um, a, a poltergeist spirit began to manifest in the house. Doors were opening and closing by themselves. Um, lights were switching on and off. Televisions, electronic equipment going haywire. Um, sometimes even writings on the walls uh, were taking place. Things like that. And many, many times it's because somebody in the house tried to call up spirits. Either by playing glassy glassy or playing with an actual Ouija board. People go in, uh, get involved in fortune telling. Um, even Christian people like to know what the future holds. Let me tell you something about Satan. Satan does not know the future. He knows your past because it's happened. He knows your present because you're living it right now. The future, he curses you when he talks about your future because he does not have access to the realm of God. He cannot tell you nothing about your future, but he can curse your future. Drugs. 
Drug abuse takes us to a higher plane of consciousness. People become aware of the spirit world and open a door for spirits to start working. People go and see mediums because people want to know, uh, is my uncle okay, is my auntie okay, is my departed wife all right, etc., etc., creates big problems because the moment you mess with these things, you've opened the door for something to attach itself to your life, you will have problems. I prayed with a woman a couple of years ago, I think it was about two years ago, that was involved with these kind of things, and there was a spirit that manifested and spoke to her at one point in time through some medium, and uh, this thing became a spiritual husband. This thing would rape her at night, it would have all sorts of sexual things with her, and when I eventually cast it out, it came out that this thing came to her through that, attached through that, and from that time on dominated her life. She also had no relationships that could last from that time on because that spirit claimed her and would not allow another man to come close to her. When you play with the devil's things, you're going to get burnt. People go to clairvoyance, which is just a different word for fortune-telling, People mess around with meditation. Listen to me very carefully. There is nothing wrong with meditating on the word of God, which is simply taking a scripture, pondering it, praying to God, applying it into your life, seeing how it applies into your life and how you need to change your life to live according to it. That would be seen as Christian meditation. But then we have the people that stare into a flame, they sit in the lotus position, they keep calling on um, you know, all sorts of funny things, and then they start sort of zoning out and they go into some sort of a trance. They're not going into a trance. A spirit that they start, that they're calling on is starting to gain control over them. The problem is that spirit doesn't go when you come out of the trance. It has now attached itself to your life and it begins to control your life. Let me remind you, Satan comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And from that day on, you are going to have nothing but problems. Um, there is a, a big resurgence in people getting all inquisitive about oriental cults and philosophies, things like yoga, etc., etc. Listen to me, people. The Bible says very clearly, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is jealous. You cannot claim to serve God, but you're messing around with false religions because you're looking for trouble. When you dance with the devil, he will step on your toes. He wears very long, high stilettos. You're going to suffer. My friends, please, listen to me very carefully. If you are looking at other religions from the point of view of speaking to those people and witnessing to them, I cannot say anything bad about that. But if you're simply inquisitive and you simply want to know, you know, just in this last week, I had somebody phone me and I prayed with them over the phone. They got a bit involved in another religion. They became inquisitive. They began to ask questions. And here's what happened. They began to doubt their own salvation. Friends, I want you to listen to me very carefully. We need to be rooted in the word of God. You need to be in a place where no matter what somebody else says, it is not going to influence you by just Knowing about the word, you're probably going to be influenced. You must know the word. You must be rooted in the word. Reincarnation. Let me be very honest with you and say to you that reincarnation is just a way that the devil has to mess with people's lives. The Bible says it is appointed for man to have one life and then to die. We are not going to have multiple lives. You have an opportunity right now to know who God is, to know God, to get close to God, and to enter into salvation. If you miss it this time, you see, this, it's another Eastern philosophy. The Buddhists believe that you come back. You come back over and over and over again. And the reason you come back is because you have not fulfilled your purpose properly. You have not attained enlightenment they believe to some ex extent that when you reach that place, you become God himself. And so if you haven't managed that before, you're going to come back. If you lived a very bad life, you can actually come back as a cockroach. So you, you kind of like need to watch it. That's why in, in Buddhism, some of the monks would even walk with a little 
a little, uh, what do you call it, a quasi, a, a brush, because they can't, that, that could be their uncle that's walking there, you know, it's like we, we have to, you know. I'm not being disrespectful, it's the truth. The fact of the matter is that these people believe that you're going to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back until you figure it out and you reach that level of consciousness. From a Christian point of view, we can never, ever, ever believe anything to that point because we have the opportunity while we are down here to find God. We have the opportunity to enter into salvation. But you see, here's the thing. The devil wants people to believe that if I mess up this time, I'll have another chance. How many people are on the other side asking God, where's my other chance? Because you told me that I, I can come back. I have a second chance. And God's going to say to them, no, you had this one chance. You heard the word of God. You did understand salvation, but you believed a lie. Don't forget Satan is a liar. There are many lies out there that try and tap people on the back and say to them, it's not that bad. You'll have another chance. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. You have one life to find him. You don't have three or four or five. So don't let people come to you and say to you, ah, don't worry, if you miss it this time, you'll get it on the second time around. You'll get it on the rebound. There's no rebound. There's today. Make it count. If you don't know God, find out how to find him. If you don't know the, the, the principles of biblical salvation, speak to somebody that can help you and enlighten you. Or even better, read the Bible. Apply the word of God. Astrology and horoscopes. Listen to me very carefully. Yes, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. But the sun, the moon, and the stars are not speaking to you about your life. The only one that can speak to you about your life is God. He speaks through his word. And yes, he might have a prophet or two somewhere that could speak to you. And whatever they say will be in line with the word of God, not against the word of God. Demons like to speak through these things. Why? Because people put their faith in these things, and that gives the enemy the place and the power to mess with their lives. Hypnosis, I shared with you last week that hypnosis brings about total control. Satan is all about control. Automatic writing, it's people that write. Uh, those of you that have listened to the series that I did on the music will know that Alistair Crowley, uh, who basically is the father of modern-day Satanism, was camped in Egypt at the foot of the pyramids at the turn of the century. And uh, one day a spirit began to speak through him. Not speak through him, write through him. It introduced itself. It said that its name was Horus. And it told him that he was to be like the Messiah or something to that effect. Oh no, he was the Antichrist. And that he had a purpose in life. This and this and this is what he had to do. And that became his first book. I think he entitled it, Do As Thou Wilt. In other words, total rebellion, do what you want, don't care, there's no God, etc., etc. The devil has confused a lot of people, messed with a lot of people, controlled a lot of people's lives through these kind of things. And then we have things like acupuncture, iridology, reflexology, which are all rooted in Eastern culture, which we need to be very, very careful of. I prayed with a man once. The man was very sick. When I prayed for him, a demon manifested. When the demon manifested, I eventually asked the demon, where did you come from? The demon told me straight it entered when he went through acupuncture and that somehow through the acupuncture, the person that was using the needles and all of that gained some form of control over this person's life. After we cast that demon out, the man got healed. Never forget that these things are rooted in their religion. It is a false religion. Anything false is demonic in the eyes of God. Anything demonic is going to lead to problems. God's word makes it very clear that we are to hate the enemies of God. Psalm 139 from verse 21 says, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as my enemies. If we listen to the scripture, we 
have the revelation and the realization that God expects us to be against his enemies, not for his enemies. When I pray for people for deliverance, I will often say to them, God will deliver you from your enemies, not your friends. Whatever you've made your friend and not your enemy as God wants it will never leave you. It has to be your enemy. We cannot try to live in peace with an enemy of God and expect God's peace to manifest in our lives. People often try to justify reasons why they entertain certain things. But no matter what your reasoning, if it is an enemy of God, it should be an enemy of yours. Acts chapter 19 shows us the only acceptable biblical way to deal with this kind of stuff. Acts 19 verse 17 to 19 Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Now, listen to this. These people were willing to come and publicly say, I've messed up, I've, I've played around with this. If this was in today's society... People would come with their Ouija boards. They would come with their horoscopes. They would come with their crystals and their crystal balls. They would come with their tarot cards. They would come with all of these things that are wrong, that people still mess around with, and they would put them. And 50,000 drachmas back then were said to be around $5.5 million. Do you know what some people sometimes say to me when They've got problems, we go to their home, we go pray for them. I'll point out something and I'll say, you know what, that's against the word of God. Oh, okay, what should I do with it? Well, you should realistically burn it. Oh, do you know how much it cost me? Well, what money can you put? What value can you put on your peace? Please explain to me. Right now you have no peace. You got me to come and pray at your house because you have problems. I don't have problems, you have them. I'm applying the word of God. I'm showing you the things that are wrong. And your only reasoning is, well, then I'm going to lose a lot of money. Well, then you're going to constantly lose your peace. Because there is no way around it. Yes, the devil's things are expensive. I went to a, a girl's home once. She couldn't sleep. Insomnia. To the point that uh, she was literally going mad. You know, when you don't sleep and don't sleep and don't sleep, your brain begins to go all funny and weird. And so her parents got me to come and pray for her. And um, <clears throat> I walked into her room and I immediately, as I walked into the room, understood the, the problem. You see, she had a fixation with dragons. Her whole room was full of dragons, very articulate, very uh, fancy, ornate dragons. So I look at that and I start laughing. The father says, why are you laughing? I said, because I see the problem. The girl's looking at me. She sees where I'm looking. She says, don't tell me it's my dragons. I said, it's your dragons. She said to me, do you know what it cost me? I said to her, how much would you pay for a good night's sleep? Would you not give anything for a good night's sleep? She said, yes. I said, well, it's not going to cost you that. It's just going to cost you understand something. Are you a child of God? She said, yes. I said, who is the dragon in the Bible? No, she doesn't know. I read her the scriptures. The Bible says Satan, being the dragon, fought against the angels of God. Or, or sorry, Michael fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and he was thrown out of the heavens. There is only one dragon. It's called Satan. When you bring those things into your house, you give the devil place. Please understand. And no matter how you argue about these things or reason about these things, your opinion does not matter. You serve God. His opinion matters. How many times have I encountered people, I don't see it that way, then I can't help you. Because you shouldn't be seeing it your way. You should be seeing it from a biblical point of view. You cannot argue with the word of God. It doesn't help one day you want to get to heaven and argue with God that I shouldn't have been sick because I had these things around me. It's too late. 
You should have listened to the word of God while you had the opportunity. They did get rid of the dragons. They broke them. I can't remember how much it cost her, but it was thousands and thousands and thousands of rands. But you know what happened that night? She slept like a baby. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't make the rules. God does. And the best thing that we can do is drop our attitude. You know, you know what's wrong with society today? Everybody's always right. Nobody's ever wrong. You tell them it's this way, but no, it can't be that way. But why is it that way? Oh, that's not right. Oh, God shouldn't have. Listen, I'm not here to argue with you. Do you want to hear the truth or not? Because if today you're not interested, there's a lot of other people that actually want to listen. It's not about your opinion. It's not about your uncle or your auntie or your opa's opinion. Man's opinion is why we're all in trouble. We need to follow God. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth is not what Oprah spews on her show. It's what God says. Hello? There's a lot of people out there that according to them, they're preaching the truth. But compare what they're saying with the word of God and you're going to find holes in their story. The only one that you should be listening to, the only one that you should be following is the word of God. <clears throat> These people were willing to publicly renounce and denounce all the contact that they had with Satan's power. Can I tell you what will immediately turn this world around and make the world a better place? If mankind all the way from here to Timbuktu was to take all the rubbish that they believe in, everything that was occultic, that was satanic, that was demonic, that was centered around witchcraft and sorcery and control and manipulation and rebellion and the spirit of Jezebel, etc., etc., and burn it, the world overnight would actually change. Because all these things we play with execute influence over our lives, the way we think, the way we speak, the way we do things. A number of years ago, I'm going to share this to bring across a point. I was asked to pray for a pastor's daughter. She had suddenly become extremely rebellious. To the point that she was constantly fighting with her father. We are talking about somebody that was brought up along the lines of the word of God. Who was given good example by both her father and her mother. But there was a sudden change that came into her life. I sat down and I began to ask a couple of questions. The first thing that became clear is the friends that she made at school clearly involved in satanic things. The second thing that was very clear was the kind of music that she was listening to, which was totally dark, macabre, centered around death, very, very evil. And thirdly, she was wearing a pentagram. What is a pentagram? It's a symbol of Satan. When you look at a pentagram, you basically have the two horns of the goat. You have the two, like, bulky beard things of the goat, or the ears of the goat, and you have the, the bulky coming down. So when you look at a pentagram, you can literally draw the goat there. Who's the goat? Satan. It's a, a symbol that is used widely in Satanism. And you know what? Until that girl did not get rid of the stuff that she brought into herself, into her room, into her house. Nothing changed. When she got rid of it, her attitude changed. What happened? Some people would like to tell us that objects cannot influence us. Let me tell you something. An object is not just an object. Yes. Probably we can argue that this is just a camera or that is just a chair, but certain objects represent something. And once it represents something, if it was to represent Baal, it will always represent Baal, whether you believe in Baal or not, doesn't matter. If it represents uh, Krishna, it will always represent Krishna, whether you believe in Krishna or not, it doesn't matter. And if it represents Satan, 
No amount of arguing from your side or complaining from your side is going to change anything in Satan's eyes. That's me. Oh, you want me in your presence? You're willing to have me with you? Then you must have the influence that I bring as well. For these people, money was not an object. They chose to honor God no matter what the cost. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where we should all get to. It's not about the hundred rand you paid for something or the thousand or the 20,000 rand that you paid for something. If it is a problem, it is a problem. If it's robbing you of your peace, it's robbing you of your peace. And if it's bringing a division between you and God, then you should do whatever you can to eradicate that from your life so that you can come back to God. Today I hear many believers tell me, oh, but that was my mother's or that was my grandfather's or that was my uncle's or that cost me a lot of money. Have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness. Ephesians 5, 11. And again, what price do we put on salvation, peace, healing, sanity? If you or your ancestors have given Satan place through any of these practices, you probably do need some form of deliverance. Now, talking about deliverance, here are six steps that will eventually bring about deliverance. Why do we need to hear that? Because some of us really need to be delivered. Number one, probably the most important one, and I'm actually going to read something that I would like to share with you along with this one. I'm going to read to you from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12. The first step to getting delivered is you must be humble. Humble yourself before God. Listen, yeah, the word of God says, humble yourself before God and God himself will raise you up. People that need deliverance are in a pit. The enemy has you captive in some pit. Could be the pit of despair, depression, fear, anxiety, fright, sickness, torment, whatever you want to put there. But if you want to come out of that pit, you need to humble yourself before God. I want to read you something about David. You know, we often hear that David was a man after God's own heart. We know that David was known to be a friend of God. Listen to something about David's life. The Lord sent Nathan to David when he came to him. He said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other one poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and he grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a bad thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you as king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword, shall ne the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. 
and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I want you to listen to me carefully. David got a word of rebuke from God. A prophet of God knocked on his door, shared with him a story that had a moral tale. David, without realizing, took the bait and committed himself that this is wrong and this person needs to pay. And then the prophet said, the story is about you. Now hear the word of the Lord. David was rebuked by a prophet of God. How did David handle it? David humbled himself before God. He did not turn to the prophet and say, who the hell do you think you are? How dare you come into my house and speak to me like this in front of my family? Who do you think you are? David put his head down. He realized what had happened. And he said, I have sinned before the Lord. Can I tell you what the problem is today? Whenever there's a word of rebuke, people get angry. And instead of being humble, they become pride, proud. This is not true. I will never accept this. Who do you think you are? My friends, if you ever want to experience the power of God, you need to learn to be humble. I'm thinking of that song. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. I want to tell you something. I see that all the time. People find it very difficult to be humble. I want to ask you a question. How many of you believe that God can ever be wrong? Can ever, not never. How many of you believe that God can ever, E-V-E-R, ever be wrong? Okay, so are we in agreement that we believe that God is right? But then why many times do people treat God like he's wrong? Have you ever thought of that? Because that's exactly what they do. You preach a certain sermon. Oh, that's rubbish. Oh, that's nonsense. Oh, God will never allow that. But you've just read what the scripture says. And it's a problem for people. Do you know when our lives are going to change? When we stop trying to fight with God about things. When God tells you something is wrong, accept it. You know, there were times when your children were young, when you forbid them certain things, and they didn't understand it, and they got angry, but you knew why you did it, and you knew you were right. And later on, your children knew you were right. God does that to you many times. Sometimes God says no to certain things. Sometimes God warns you. Sometimes God rebukes you, but he knows he's right. He knows why he's doing those things. The problem that we have, we get angry. We get frustrated. Ah, this is not right. Ah, God will never do that, my friend. God just sent a prophet to walk into David's house and tell David in front of his family, this is what you've done. This is the consequences. And you still want to tell me God doesn't do these things? Think again. David humbled himself before God. That was forgiven. Number two. So step one to deliverance, humble yourself. Step two, be completely honest. Call a spade a spade. Here's the thing. When we deal with people in the area of deliverance, they always try to play down what they've done. Yes, yes, I did mess up, but take into account that, this and that and what. And you know what? It's just I'm justifying why I did what I did. There's your problem. You keep justifying the problem. Call a spade a spade. If you messed up, you messed up. Say, I have messed up. David did not. Oh, but please, you you must take into account her husband wasn't good for her. And and she was actually much better for me. And he he just said, I have sinned before God. Number three, confess your sins. You know, God is a bit old-fashioned. 
He still believes in confession. The Bible says, confess your sins, therefore, one to another. God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I cannot tell you how many times in a session of deliverance we have encountered demons manifesting in people that will not leave. Many, many times it has been because something was never confessed. Whatever you are hiding from the person praying with you, you also try to hide from God. But understand something, both God and the devil saw what happened when it happened. None of them can be fooled by your silence or your deceitfulness. In fact, the demons in your life like the fact that you will not confess it because they see that as you are harboring me, you are protecting me, you like me, you want me. They'll never go nowhere. Number four, we must repent and renounce all evil. Please remember that repentance means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. When you come before God and you say, Lord, I confess these things, I repent. God expects to see some change. Amen? There must be change. You need to start changing your life. The fifth one is very important. We have to forgive. I want to tell you there's quite a few people sitting here today. You have unforgiveness in your heart. Yes, you spin it in a way that it doesn't look that way, but you have unforgiveness in your heart. And while you have an unforgiving attitude towards other people, God says in his word, he cannot forgive you either. Because in order for you to receive God's forgiveness, you must first be willing to give forgiveness to others. I fully realize that some people have hurt you. I fully realize that some people can really be idiots. But that still does not give you the right to keep harboring resentment and unforgiveness towards them. Because what you need to understand about unforgiveness, it does not hurt the other party. It only hurts you. It is in your life that the doorway is open for the enemy to come in and torment you. <clears throat> Jesus said in his own words that if we do not forgive our brother, their trespasses from our heart, his father in heaven will not forgive us. And he will send the tormentors to us to torment us until we have forgiven. What do tormenting spirits do? Well, fine, they torment us, but how do they torment us? Some people are tormented through pain. Some people are tormented through emotional instability. Some people are tormented through mental instability. Some people are tormented through sickness and infirmity. It just depends where the devil gets his hooks into you. But the fact is, when the root cause of the problem that you have is unforgiveness, all the prayer in the world for you to be healed, for you to change, for God's blessing to be upon you, for God to help you, will do nothing. Because God cannot override his own word until you do not forgive your brother. They trespasses from your heart. God will not forgive you you. Now the Bible says, give the devil no place. If I am living my life in a place where I have not received God's forgiveness, every sin in my life is relevant. I cannot claim to be under the blood of the lamb because the blood of the lamb ceases to exist in the life of a person that is riddled with unforgiveness. The Bible says you cannot be forgiven until you forgive. So therefore, what have you got to Keep the enemy at bay if the blood of the lamb is no longer relevant in your life. Nothing. That means that the devil has the right to torment you day and night. Will he do so? Oh, yes, he will. Then we need to call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. The problem is most people call on the name of the Lord without applying the other requirements. Number one, humble yourself. Number two, be completely honest. Call a spade a spade. Number three, confess your sins. Number four, repent and renounce all evil. And there I want to say, including what you might have brought into your home. 
I'm not going to go into that in too much detail now because that's coming a bit later, but a lot of people bring a lot of rubbish into their homes. Number five, forgive every other person, including yourself. You are also a person. Some people's unforgiveness is not towards other people. They realize they did something really difficult or bad that hurt another person, and then they sit with this thing, I will never forgive myself. How many times in a session has somebody said to me, I will never forgive myself? You're still putting yourself under the same curse. Because whether I refuse to forgive Wilson or I refuse to forgive myself, it's unforgiveness. And that stops God's forgiveness. Then we call on the name of the Lord to help us. And we take authority over the works of darkness. A couple of common questions regarding demons. A lot of people will say to me, Oh, but Rian, how do I know whether I am completely free? Let me say first and foremost that I can't give you a certificate. Nobody can. There's also no place for me to plug something in and take a diagnosis of you, like, you know, with a car, the car breaks down, we plug the computer in, it tells us that this and this and this is wrong. I can try and plug things in, but I'm going to get error. For <laughs> There's nothing that can tell me. God is the only one that knows. There is no guarantees at any time that you are free. Deliverance tends to be a process. Can everybody say the word process? Deliverance tends to be a process, and every person needs to be able to see and identify demonic afflictions in their own lives. That's why we need to know the Word of God. Then we can see where things are right or wrong. Then we know, I'm sitting with a problem. Yes, something here is not right. Deliverance is a bit like peeling an onion. There are different layers. Have you ever sucked a knicker ball? Okay, so the young people here don't know what I'm talking about. Back in our day... You know, I, I went to school in Turfentine, Forest Hill area, and there was a, a cafe right across the school. And I remember when we used to get out, somebody would have a couple of cents. Back in those days, you could sometimes get up to four knicker balls for a cent, something to that effect. We would run to the cafe, and everybody would sit and suck the knicker ball. And then that was great fun because you would suck, 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 and then you take it out. Okay, mine is pink now. That one is orange. That one is purple. We suck a bit more. Okay, now mine is orange, and that one is this. And, and so you go on. So... The thing is, when you first look at that knicker ball, it's just black. But it's not just black. It's made up of many different layers that eventually creates that ball. When we pray for people, we are sort of peeling that onion layer by layer by layer. And sometimes you literally will never know what the next spirit is until you first cast out the spirit that was covering that spirit. Because it was hidden underneath. If anger is the dominant spirit, then until you haven't dealt with anger and anger has been cast out of the person, you won't realize that anger was actually being fed by fear, which was under anger. And now that anger is gone, fear is starting to show itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? So therefore, it is sometimes a process. Many, many times in the past when I've prayed with people on a, on a process of deliverance, I've had them come to me and say to me on a weekly basis, after every time that they've received prayer, they have found that their personality seems to go from this extreme to that extreme to that extreme. No, it's not that. It's this thing came out, it's lost its power, so this thing is now in charge. It's, it's flexing its muscles, and you're feeling that, you're experiencing what that thing is doing, which is not a bad thing because now we know that that's the area where we need to pray to today. That's where the problem lies now. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 22. The Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply all around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you. When Israel went into the promised land, God said to them, I will not give you this entire land all at once. I expect you to fight city by city, town by town. And once you've conquered a city, 
colonize it, become strong, then move to the next one, colonize it, become strong. What happens if we conquer here, we move on, we conquer there, we move on, we conquer there, we move on, we conquer there. This is empty, this is empty, this is empty. The Philistines see that everything is empty. They come in from the bottom and they take over again. So that doesn't help. And it's exactly the same. What good is it that the Lord one day takes out 20 spirits from a person, but that person has no way of, no foundation, no, no, hasn't got what is needed to fill that space. If it's empty, something will come back. So God knows how to deal with this. Now, I want you to understand something. When it comes to these kind of things in deliverance, no person is in charge. The Holy Spirit is in charge. The Holy Spirit knows what you can handle and what you can't. He knows what you're ready for and what you're not ready for. And when you are not ready for something, he's not going to touch there because I can't deliver you. The Holy Spirit does that work. And sometimes a person is just not in a place where their faith is sufficient to sustain them after the victory. Because remember, getting the house clean is one thing. Keeping the house clean is another. What happens in South Africa when you move off a property? When they even s remotely think it might be empty, the next thing you know, you've got like 300 people living there. And then it becomes very difficult to get rid of them. We call them squatters. Well, demons are a lot like squatters. When they see an empty house, they come quickly. So God wants for your house, which is your heart, not to be empty. Your heart needs to be filled and faith is needed. What if your faith is not at a level at this point in time that it can actually sustain you through this time? Then these things are just going to come back. So God is going to say to you, if there was some conversation, God would say to you, my child, I do love you. And yes, I want to deliver you, but you're not ready. Because whatever leaves is going to come back and there's going to be a big war when they come back and you're too weak, you're going to lose. Become stronger. Spend time in my word. Grow in your faith. And then we'll deal with this. Amen? Israel had to enter the promised land and war against the nations there to take possession of their promise. God warned them that he would not allow them to take it all at once. He told them you will have it little by little. They had to first maintain victory in one area before they would be allowed to go to another area. And deliverance works exactly the same way. Let's say that the person has 50 demons and gets delivered by God from all of them at once. The Bible warns us that all 50 of them are going to try to come back. So there's the question, are you strong enough? Is your faith of a level that can sustain you when all these things try to come back? I see my time is basically up. I want to ask you a question. Are you learning something from what we're sharing here? Is it helping you to understand how these things work? Well, I'm blessed to hear that. And I pray that the truths that I'm sharing with you is going to help you, and maybe you might not need that kind of help, but you might know other people that do, then you can give them the correct information. Amen? Amen. All right. Father God, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for the word of God. I thank you that the word of God imparts wisdom. I thank you that the word of God brings light into the areas that are in darkness. Today, your word spoke to us about many things that people get involved in that they should never have. And for those that are going to be watching this online, dear Lord, as they humble themselves before you, as they repent, as they are willing to forgive and to change their lives, as they come to you and cry out to you for mercy, I thank you, Lord, that you hear their prayers and that you answer them. I thank you, Lord, that it says in your word, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you still work in the lives of God's saints to set the captives free. I speak the blessing of God over every single person 
that comes to the realization that they have opened that door and they need to get rid of the rubbish and seal that door and be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The Lord is for you, not against you. The Lord will help you. The Lord will be gracious to you. The Lord will pick you up and the Lord will deliver you. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.